Hey you! Thank you for joining me again on Richard Bay Talk. Along with my producer, Santa Claus. Oh, no, no, wait a second. It's Albert Reynoso with a beard that keeps growing and growing and growing. For the time being. For the time being. <laughs> but at Christmas time, there are going to be a lot of job openings at Macy's for it you. It won't be here at Christmas time. Trust me. I know that already. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Albert. All right. So many things happened this week that it, 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 it's hard to know where to begin. But uh, uh, President Biden went to Saudi Arabia and uh, met with MSB, who is a guy he decried as a murderer and uh, the head of a pariah state. And he gave him a fist bump. And that was the picture you saw. All week. Oh, he gave him a fist bump. Do you remember a few years ago when uh, Fox News described uh, uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama as having a terrorist fist bump? Um, the New Yorker uh, made a satirical cover about that there. I have this framed and on my wall in the living room. Uh, maybe, maybe Joe Biden was giving us a signal that he considered MSB a terrorist and he wouldn't pick it up by, by giving him the terrorist fist bump. All right. So uh, the visit wasn't, you know, super productive. Uh, they got a few things. They got uh, the right of Israel to fly its planes and everybody else to fly its planes over Saudi Arabia. When they were en route, uh, they got, depending on whom you believe, uh, some sort of commitment to increase oil production, but very vague. But with all the criticism of this trip, I mean, you know, things change. Do you think FDR leaned over to Stalin uh, you know, at um, at Yalta and said, um, hey, we know you killed Trotsky. Don't think you're getting away with anything. I don't think so. Anyway, um, it certainly was more productive than the trip Donald Trump took to North Korea to see his boyfriend. All we got out of that was a couple of love letters. Um, and even in China, his meetings with Xi, the, the trade deal we got ended up being a total bust. And uh, Trump was back here proclaiming, I love Xi, a few months later, blaming him for um, for infecting the world uh, with one of the worst plagues we've seen in modern history. So, yeah, things do change. But the big issue is inflation. Even though inflation is an international phenomenon, even though the Republicans have no plan on how to deal with inflation, and in fact, most economists will tell you the only way to deal with it is to go through a recession, which is sort of a reset, which nobody wants. I do have to tell you the gas prices have come down a bit, and my own inflation indicator, I can't believe it's not butter. My heart raced. I gasped. You know, when I first bought this, and this is a necessity for me, because every time I eat, go to the movies, I bring it to spray the popcorn, and I'm going to go see Elvis as soon as this podcast is over, and I'll be there going on the popcorn. Well, when I first started buying it, it was like three bucks, three seventy-five, something like that, and then it went to four twenty, then it went to four seventy, and it went all the way up to $5 and 5 cents. It now has come down to $4 and 75 cents. So a seven cent decrease, but at least something is coming down. Now, when it comes to inflation, I have to tell you, I survived 15% inflation. That's almost double what we have now. And at the time, I was making $350 a week under studying a show on Broadway. But I survived. When I got my first mortgage, I, I bought a townhouse in Philadelphia. My, my mortgage interest rate was 12.5%. And I was ecstatic because not too many years before, mortgage rates were 18%. But I survived. I, in 2009, I lost every cent that I had. I went to bed and I had uh, mid six figures in my bank account. I woke up in the morning 
and I had two hundred dollars in my wallet and three dollars in my bank account. That checks were uh, bouncing like pensy pinkies everywhere, but I survived. That was the financial crash in two thousand and nine. And I survived a gas crisis. You think this is bad? I don't know how old some of you are, but I, there was a time when we rationed gas. Where, where, where you, had to, you had to have a license plate number, either with an even or an odd number, in order to get online. And even then, the line stretched through the gas station down the driveway, out into the street, you had to call police to direct traffic because the lines were extending through the throughways. But I survived. On the other hand, our country will not survive if we give up on democracy and we abandon the peaceful transition of power. So for me, that is the most important uh, election issue coming up. We have a large group of people in this country. They're not a majority. But they, if they don't desire it, it doesn't bother them to have a right-wing authoritarian government. Now, there are, are some on the right who see that as a great threat. But... There's too large a group that doesn't care about authoritarianism. They care about power, getting their way, an imposition. They don't care about democracy, really. And it's not an insignificant group of Americans. Now, on Facebook, one of my friends, Alyssa, sent me a message saying, listen, most people in this country don't care you know, about what happened on January 6th. They care about the price of gas. They care about the price of eggs and the price of of uh, uh, of milk and, the, you know, the price of the, uh, the rent that they have to pay. And they don't care about democracy. And now she may be right in that assessment, but let me tell you, what if I told you there was a leader who brought unemployment down from 6 million to 180,000 in just six years. Hmm. What if I told you that he brought down absurd levels of inflation down to something manageable? What if I told you with infrastructure in this country, you know, we had infrastructure every week. We finally got a bill passed, but he built infrastructure. That was the marvel, the marvel of the globe. What have I told you about that guy? What have I told you about a guy who, who took the country from humiliation to a point of international respect? What have I told you about that leader? It sounds pretty good on the one hand. On the other hand, that leader was Adolf Hitler. And after Hitler got in power, that was the end of democracy until a devastating world war and the destruction of his country. Now, during this past week as well, there's lots of speculation that Trump will run again. Today, Rolling Stone is quoting unnamed sources that say Trump wants to announce very soon uh, because he figures that he will not be prosecuted during a time when he's campaigning for the office of president or as president. And the major uh, uh, person that seems to be mentioned as the, as the possible opponent of Trump is Ron DeSantis, who is currently running for governor of Florida for a second term. He won the first term by 0.4%, but he's probably uh, you know more popular among Floridians now. But doesn't Governor DeSantis owe it 
to the citizens of his state to tell them if he's going to run for president and just be a governor for one year. Because if he decides to run for president, he'll spend a year campaigning, and then if he wins, he'll, he'll, he'll be out of the state. But don't you think that should be a campaign issue now? Among other things, there's so many other things, but I won't get into that because it's kind of provincial uh, to Florida. Now, but I would say, you know, he should be forced to say whether he's going to run for president before the election for governor. Now, Joe Biden, there's a general consensus, even among Democrats, that he's too old to run again. When people voted for Joe Biden, they didn't vote for Joe Biden saying, oh, I'm so enthusiastic. No, they voted for Joe Biden because they wanted a return to normalcy from four years of radical insanity culminating in January 6th. And Joe Biden, who'd been around a long, long time, seemed to represent a kind of normalcy that we'd known in American government for so many years. But if he were to run again, my God, he'd be what, like 84 by the time he finishes his presidency, maybe even older. He's too old. It, you know, I don't want to make Hitler analogies all the way through this podcast, but <laughs> since I already started, Joe Biden is our Hindenburg. Um, on the Democratic side, people say, well, who, who could possibly run? Certainly not Kamala Harris, who's been a major disappointment. But we have Sherrod Brown, who has won the Senate seat in Ohio, a red state, three times, three times very strong cred with working class people, with unions. We have Amy Klobuchar, who could possibly run again. People have even brought up Hillary, who's been very impressive when she appears on television, cogent, um, precise. Um, I don't, th that's, she's certainly not my favorite. And then you have Gavin Newsom, who is, the governor of California looks like a president, looks like Mitt Romney, who looked like a president, but lost. And Gavin Newsom seems to understand the situation we're in. This is not a normal time. This is not a normal election season. This is a period of time that is a pivotal moment in our country's history and its preservation of our democratic system. Gavin Newsom said this, Republicans across the country are so vested in taking power any way they can, whether through legitimate or illegitimate means, that Democrats who are, you know, tr trying to play by the rules they're playing on a different playing field. Here, take a look at this clip of now, Gavin Newsom. We're up against the ruthlessness of a Republican Party. And I say that not naively. I don't say that even blithely. I'm not, that's not a cheap shot. You see what's happening to all the progress we've made in the 21st century. All of the rights that we in many ways have taken for granted that have been afforded since the 60s are being rolled back in real time. This is a totally different moment. And we have to wake up with a different mindset and not just the old mindset in terms of just a collaborative mindset, a cup of tea and everyone's going to work together to get along, big ways uh, to, to advance the collective cause. And that's where the party needs to come in. Democrats need the Democratic Party, not the president, not a speaker, not a elected office holder, the party, the infrastructure, I think has to organize with more ferocity of focus more determination to set the agenda, set the course, and put the other party on the defense. They are dominating the narrative. 
The facts aren't on their side, but they're dominating the narrative. And in this world right now, you dominate the narrative, you win. And that's what I'm worried about, and that's what I'm expressing. And he's absolutely right. Now, Teddy Roosevelt said about uh, his opponent, Robert Taft, he said, he means well, but he means well weakly. And, you know, Biden is pretty much cut from the same cloth. He means well. But he doesn't have that ferocity that uh, Gavin Newsom was just talking about. You want an example? Remember the Republican conveyor belt to get judges confirmed? Oh, my God, they slammed them through one after so many people who showed up and were completely unqualified, embarrassing in some cases in front of the uh, confirmation committee. Some of them even had to drop out because they were so embarrassing. Um, even at one point, they held the, the interview to pass on the uh, confirmation during a recess, so only two Republicans. <laughs> there was not one Democrat to ask questions. There were only two Republicans. One was Grassley. I forget who the other one was. Also, they didn't care. Um, they didn't care about blue slips. They were, you know, the, what the blue slips are. In order to get confirmed, it's not a law. It's not a piece of legislation, but there's a Senate tradition that in order to be confirmed, the judge has to have two blue sip slips uh, given to the Senate, which are the okay, uh, which are the endorsement of those senators. Republicans, they didn't care about blue slips. We care about blue slips. Um. And if, if, if you want an example of this, right now, there are 119 vacancies on the circuit court for judges. 119. You know, we're a year and a half into this presidency. I mean, <laughs> McConnell would have had them confirmed six months ago. We have 119 vacancies. And of those 119, 80 of them, nobody's even, uh, Biden hasn't even bothered to make a nominee. 80 out of 119, there's not even a person proposed to fill that judicial position. He means well weekly. All right. Now, during the week, of course, one of the big stories was uh, the 10-year-old girl who had been raped in uh Ohio and had to go to Indiana to get an abortion and the uh, the right wing media saying oh well you know this story was probably made up it could not be true i don't have to go into that but uh, when trump ran for president this is what he said look at this he said i'll appoint supreme court justices to overturn roe v wade abortion case he said that. He didn't say, I'll appoint justices who will look at the law. I'll appoint originalists. He said, they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade. So when they went in for confirmation and they said, well, it, yeah, it's settled law. And, or, you know, I looked at this up. Even Justice Thomas, when he was confirmed so long ago, he said, I believe the right to privacy is in the Constitution. He said that. And all the others said a good judge wouldn't overturn this kind of precedent. Now, you know, the 10-year-old girl, you know, that's one case. It got a lot of attention, attention. But there were 52 girls under the age of 15 in Ohio in 2020 who had abortions. That's one a week. And it isn't just abortion. This week, Ted Cruz came out and said that uh, gay marriage, gay marriage was wrongly decided. Of course, Justice Thomas had already said that too. But it isn't just gay marriage. 
It's contraception. Now, before you watch this clip, understand that this candidate running for the Michigan State House was endorsed by Donald Trump. And as you watch this clip and you say, oh, somebody like this couldn't, she's in the She's in the primary, but she'll never get elected. Before you start to laugh and say that could never happen, think about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Think about Mo Brooks. Think about Lauren Boebert. And then think about Jackie Eubanks, the Trump-endorsed candidate for the Michigan House of Representatives. Watch this. Full Catholic, meaning you believe everything the church teaches? Yes. Everything? Yes. Everything? Yes. So you are, uh, uh, you see that the, the use of contraception is against the natural moral law, yes. uh, is destructive, a doorway to abortion, blah, yes. blah, and all that and everything else. Yes. You see the whole, everything going on with Roe, mm -hmm. for example, right now, and all the left, you know, becoming completely uncorked, losing their minds. The question, you know, they're saying, they're coming after your, your gay marriage next. They're coming after your birth control mm -hmm. after that and everything else. Well, you know what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So we need to um, make a plain statement of fact, which is the reason why the West is great is because Western civilization's underpinning is Christianity. You cannot have a successful society outside of the Christian moral order. And things like abortion and things like gay marriage are outside of the Christian moral order and they lead to chaos and destruction and a culture of death, which is why we're seeing that today. We have abandoned the Christian moral or order as a nation and we are reaping that destruction. Sex ought to be between one man and one woman in the confines of marriage. And open to life. And open to life, absolutely. All right, well, so uh, there you have it, uh, you know, and that's a Trump endorsed candidate. Um, now, Back in the day, I had a show on People Are Talking where we talked about contraception. Now, at the time, I had been on the air a few weeks before, and we were talking about birth control, and I held up a, a box of condoms, and I held up a, a diaphragm inside of its case. Not I didn't open it up and play with it. And... Um, of birth control pills. I held up a container of birth control pills. And when the show was over, I was remonstrated. You cannot show those things on television. I mean, somebody could have run up. It, it was live. <laughs> so nobody could run on the camera and grab it out of my hands. But you couldn't even show that on television. So this is not, uh, you know, uh, something entirely new. Um, the, the vice president at NBC for broadcast standards, his name was Ralph Daniels. He said, as a birth control uh, uh, device, ads for condoms are offensive to segments of our audience on moral or religious grounds. And other viewers believe that condom advertising inherently delivers a message about sexual permissiveness, which they find objectionable. And probably you've heard about the married woman who went to Walmart to buy condoms and the guy at the register said, I have to refuse to sell you this item because it's against my religious beliefs. Um, well, anyway, you'll be surprised to learn, or maybe not, that the first time a condom ad aired on national television, it was Fox News. Not, not, not the Fox News on cable that we have now, but uh, the Fox News network. And that was three, four years after this last clip was televised. Um, all right, let's take a look at that. There are some people who are strongly for it. And advertising, I think, therefore, is necessary in reference to condoms and would have a positive public health benefit. And then there are others who are firmly against it. 
The Surgeon General Coop is saying that the best method is to refrain from sexual intercourse. That's the best method. Condoms may offer protection from exposure, but does the public need protection from exposure to condoms? Good morning. Thanks for joining me this morning on People Are Talking. Schools are giving them out to students, TV stations are advertising them, the stock market is going sky high when, uh, when companies manufacture them. I'm talking about condoms, and not too long ago, you couldn't even say the word condom on television. In fact, I was a bad boy. A while back, <clears throat> we did a show on birth control clinics in high school, and then during our, our commercial, I held up a package of condoms, I held up a, a diaphragm inside of a box, and I held up birth control pills inside of their container. And later on, I was informed that is against our station policy and that I was incorrect in doing that in terms of being an employee at this station. Um, of course, now some of the stations in our market have accepted condom advertising, but it has caused quite a controversy and people are lining up on both sides of the question. And this morning, that is the essence of our debate. Suzanne Wolf is a teen pregnancy counselor, the Pro-Life Coalition of Southeastern Pennsylvania. Southeastern Pennsylvania, and Bill Baird is a pro-choice advocate. He's been called the father of the abortion movement, but also 15 years ago, he was arrested for displaying a condom in public. They said that he was publicly exhibiting indecent articles, and he spent some time in jail for that. Please welcome them to the show. Um, Suzanne, let me start with you, because I think one of the basic questions, what, what harm is there, really, in having condom advertising on TV? Where is the harm? Well, first of all, um, Surgeon General Coop said that barring abstinence, in his opinion, condoms were the best protection against AIDS. And what we're doing here by pushing condoms on TV is that we're treating the symptom and not the cause. The cause is right, casual sex. You're still also not answering my question directly. What is the harm? If you see somebody sitting at home and they see a commercial for condoms, how is that going to harm them? How does it, how does it, how is it deleterious to our lifestyle? Well, there are many ways. First of all, people are offended by this because condoms have been traditionally associated with casual sex. Secondly, um, it's giving a wrong message to people. It's saying, in effect, um, you know, if I'm going to push a condom on you, it means you're going to have sex. You know, married couples, married couples use condoms. Majority of condom users are people that engage in, in casual sex because it's something that um, is non sort of uh, biological, something that you don't take as, a, as an extended So in essence, you're saying period. selling condoms is selling casual sex? It promotes it. Yes, it does. And the studies show this. For example, 65% of teens were pushed with contraceptives during a period of time, and there was a 50% increase in premarital sex among those teens, and then we see an almost uh, corresponding increase. So what that does is it's like saying, don't rob a bank, but if you're going to, make sure you have a getaway car handy. What, what's that message? All right, Bill, before you answer that, I, I know you... Well, go ahead, answer her point. I've done a lot of shows, but this is pretty wild. The statement to compare a getaway car with somebody wanting to be responsible to protect themselves against AIDS or to protect themselves against unwanted pregnancy by the use of condoms is absolute insanity. What the hang-up really is, is that they really don't want people having intercourse who are not married. And I would suggest it's none of their business. I think it's about time we respect the rights of each American. As the Supreme Court said in my case, if the right of privacy means anything, it is the right of an individual to be free to make this decision. We certainly know we can advertise on your TV screen uh, products for hemorrhoids, products for laxatives. Vaginal uh, douche. Va why in the world can we not... You laugh, but that is a commercial on the oh. air, the mothers and daughters. Mine smells like pine, mine smells like springtime. <laughs> <laughs> but, Suzanne, but, does that offend you? The, the I'll tell you, the first time I saw those commercials, my jaw fell off. The question is, Mr. Baird is saying that we do not have the right to um, intrude on the privacy of the, of the sexual act. Well, I'm saying, and I think everyone would agree, that because AIDS is a public epidemic, the sex act no longer is such a private act. All right. So, yeah, and that was during the period of the AIDS epidemic. And even then, they opposed the use of condoms because they didn't want people to have sex. Sex is the bad. Oh, it's the bad thing. And 
to some degree, that's the they could vote for a president who grabs women by the pussy, but uh, sex is a no-no. It 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 just makes no sense. All right. So as I said, I survived. Uh, 15% inflation. I've survived uh, the gas rationing at the pump. I've survived uh, the, the high mortgage rates. I've survived, um, you know, losing all my money in the financial crash of 2009. I mean, I, what I should do is uh, sing the Elaine Stritch song uh, from Follies. Good times and bum times. I've seen them all. And my dear... I'm still here, and Richard Baytalk is still here. Um, it comes out every Monday, and let me remind you, you can listen to it in its audio form on uh, so many places where you find uh, audio podcasts like uh, Google Podcast and Apple Podcast. And also, I would implore you, pass this on to your friends. Share it on Facebook. And subscribe, and you'll you'll get this in your mailbox, your email box, every Monday. And uh, we can be together again next week. So, as always, to all of you, all my best. Take care. Yeah.